Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Five Fragen, or Five Questions, as we would say in English. This is our podcast featuring the people of the Netherlands' diplomatic network here in the U.S. We're talking with the diplomats and policy officers about the strong bonds between the United States and the Netherlands, as well as our diplomatic work in the U.S. We're focusing on the collaborations between our two countries that make our relationship a partnership that works. I'm Jeff Alanak from the Embassy's Communications Office, and today I'm in California talking with Consul General Dirk Janssen from the Consulate General in San Francisco. Thank you for joining me today, Dirk. It's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. Whenever I see your name, I have to admit, I always want to say Dirk, because if that's how we would, if in English, it would be with a K, it's, it's Kirk. So please forgive me if I, I ever, if I... Uh, I learned to call myself Dirk <laughs> in the U.S., yeah. I asked you to join me today to talk about your role as the Consul General, responsible for maintaining the diplomatic and economic ties with the 13 westernmost states. But before we explore the frontier of that discussion, I'd like to start with a more basic question. What's your background, and how'd you end up at the consulate in San Francisco? Well, it's been kind of a long and winding road. Uh, let me think where to start. Maybe in my uh, university days, I was studying economics in Maastricht, and uh, I, I really was interested in uh, in diplomacy, international politics, history, um, but also in economics. And I doubted a very long time if I w wanted to go into diplomacy or into consultancy. Those were the two things I had in mind. Hmm. <clears throat> and at the end, I, I decided to go for consultancy because I thought consultancy would a bit more of an of a intellectual challenge. That's what I thought then. Okay. Um, so I, I went into consultancy, uh, did that for, for a few years. Uh, I was a consultant on strategy and change management. Okay. Uh, with a company that was then still called Anderson Consulting, uh, which is now called Accenture. Okay. And uh, we did all sorts of uh, uh, clients from the government to, to businesses, energy companies, anything. So if a company was realized that they were on the wrong path and needed to change something, they could then come call to you and say, hey, what do you think we should do? Exactly. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So you're always based at the client uh, and you, you do your analysis, you write your report, and then you move on to, to the next one. And okay. that, that was the part of the job that after a few, re few years I got sort of bored with. Okay. Um, um, because I, I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm always on the sideline, you know, telling others what they should do. An advisor. And I, I, I want to be on a playing field. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the other thing was that it, it's, yeah, it was all about making companies more profitable, which is good, which is there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, after a few years, I got to figure out this is this is not for me. I want more. I I I need to do something that that in my view, is more in the, in the public interest. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I switched to the government, to, uh, to um, the Ministry of Economic Affairs. I worked there for a very long time mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in different capacities, but always it had something to do with competition and, and, and the functioning of markets, and that became sort of my specialty. Mm -hmm. A very interesting topic. And I had a yeah, very interesting job, but to be honest, every when you ride your bicycle from my house to to the Ministry of Economic Affairs, you always pass by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Oh, okay. And and every time I pass by there, I, I you heard you heard it calling. It's yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I thought maybe I'm you know maybe I should have made the other decision when uh, when I was um, uh, in in university. Uh -huh. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I I was happy in my job, and and and. Uh, um, but yeah, through the years, more and more, I got this sort of urge, inner urge. For, yeah, I I I really want to go abroad for a few years, okay? Uh, because I also had the feeling, yeah, you know, uh, the competition in Netherlands is very well organized by now. Uh, the 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 markets that should be liberalized have been liberalized. Uh, I I had the feeling that I was more let's say fine tuning than really working on on on, on major uh, issues okay um and then i heard that there's a uh, that there was an uh, ex sort of exchange program between uh, the ministry of foreign affairs and all the other ministries um, at the director level and and by that time i became a director within the uh, the autoriteit consument and markt which is a sort of a 
um, enforcement part of the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Okay. Um, and then I went and, and you know, got some more information, became very enthusiastic. And I said, well, let's, let's try it. Maybe, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it's something for me. And it turned out that it was. So I had a lot of conversations with the Ministry of, of, of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I, I did psychological tests. It was a process of months. Mm. Uh, but at the end of that process, they said, okay, uh, you're, you're welcome. And so this was in 2015. And uh, they sent me to, I, I, th I thought, I went into that process thinking, well, I, logic, logically I would be, I could be maybe the head of an economic department on a bigger em embassy. Okay. But then what they came up with was ambassador to Panama. Your first uh, That was role my f first role in, in, in the Affairs Ministry of, ambassador. Of, of Foreign Affairs. Wow. So that was sort of a surprise, yeah. uh, but a, not a bad surprise. And, and uh, my wife, Renee, she's born and raised in Spain, and, and she loves the tropics, so she was completely on board. Um, uh, the kids were 8 and 10 years old. They okay. didn't really want to go, but uh, <laughs> in the end it turned out well. So, so we went to Panama, and that was a big change in our lives uh, because everything was new. It was a new profession, uh, yeah. a new language, a new culture. What's the everything. language? Is it uh, Spanish? They do speak Spanish. Okay. Yeah, and I spoke a little Spanish, but not, not too much. Um, but I also fell in love with diplomacy, okay. uh, and, and I never looked back, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was on loan still then from the Ministry of Economic Affairs to... Uh, As an ambassador, Florida. you were on loan? Yeah. Wow, okay. So after four years in Panama, I went back, and I went back to the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Mm -hmm. But within a month, I think, I was in a not, uh, discussion again with a uh, conversation with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because they thought maybe next year San Francisco is coming up. Okay. We think it would be a good match. Would you be interested? And I said, yes, uh, I am. Mm -hmm. and, and our boys really wanted to go to the U.S. as well. So okay. uh, They were <laughs> both teenagers help. by then, right? Exactly. Um, so, so that's how I ended up in, uh, in, in San Francisco. Yeah. It's quite a w uh, windy route. Exactly, yeah. But sometimes that's, that ends up being the best for all, even though you don't, in, you don't know it going in. How does a consul general spend his days? Well, there's, there's not a typical day, and that's the good thing. That's the, one of the things I like about the job. Every, every day is different. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, our, in my case now, in, in this job in San Francisco, uh, I get to travel a lot, for instance. Uh, we cover 13 states. We're here in San Diego today. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, we're sitting in a hotel room uh, <laughs> like 1,500 kilometers from San Francisco, I think. Uh, so that's an example um, uh, and that's that's f a fun part of the job. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I get fed up with all the airports, and but but you know you get a lot meet a lot of interesting people. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. Um, um, you know, for instance, yesterday evening uh, at the event, mm -hmm. I met this. Uh, we had the, the the reception afterwards, and there was this um, um, yeah old Dutch man, Jewish. Mm -hmm. Okay who had, uh, um, uh, he was 88 years old. He looked much younger, but he yeah. told me his whole life story of how he was the only survivor of, of uh, the concentration camps in his family, how mm -hmm. he then went to Israel and then ended up at Berkeley and then in San Diego. And it was just an amazing, uh, heartbreaking mm -hmm. story. And those kinds of encounters are very, yeah, special. Mm -hmm. you, you, know? you can't plan those. No, and and you don't have th those kind of encounters when you when you work in the Ministry of Economic Affairs or in the Ministry of Justice, because you go out and you and you meet people. It's mm -hmm. such an important part of the job. Uh, and for instance, last week I was in uh, in LA on a visit to Universal Music. Uh, okay. And I'm a big music lover. Oh, yeah, so okay. it was fun to be there. But we were talking about AI and European regulation and, and their activities in the Netherlands and how we could help them. Mm -hmm. uh, but then for dinner, they had invited Don Was, uh, who is the, the, the head of the Blue Note label. Okay. And that's my favorite jazz label. So Blue Note. I, was, I was having okay. dinner with the boss of, of my favorite jazz label. Yeah, that. that that's fantastic. You, you know? couldn't have had that. No, yeah. exactly. So that makes it uh, that makes it a lot of fun. 
um, and we get a lot of missions uh, in in San Francisco or in our in our area. And by mission, you mean uh, trade missions? Okay. So groups of companies that come over, um, um, sometimes very big groups, sometimes smaller groups. Um, and I think, yeah, we're one of the the busiest diplomatic posts of the Netherlands in that regard. We get. Uh, What's the purpose of those missions? It varies. Uh, we get a lot of innovation missions. So these are smaller missions of, uh, for instance, the last one was on battery technology, mm-hmm. of uh, um, uh, people from Dutch universities or, or very innovative uh, startups that are working on that specific technology. And they come over to connect with the, uh, the universities uh, in, in California and visit you know, companies that are working and research institutes that are working on that same technology. But we also get r- really big trade missions. Uh, for, for instance, well, we had the prime minister in December mm-hmm. in Phoenix and in San Francisco. And uh, that was a much larger delegation. And you're talking about at least 100 people that, that come mm. over. So we have, I think, on average, two trade missions a month. To a which month. is which is yeah a lot yeah so there uh, a lot of my time is also taken up by by you know, or helping to organize that and and hosting receptions etc cetera, etc cetera. So is that a function of the size it's, it's 13 western most states so yeah. geographically it's probably half the country if not yeah population a bit more be, even <clears throat> a bit more yeah. even. okay is is that why you get so many missions this that's part of it mm-hmm. uh, but i think the main draw is uh, that we have uh, silicon valley san francisco that mm-hmm. ecosystem attracts a lot of in- attention uh, from the netherlands um, it's also the reason why we're based in san francisco we used to be in la mm-hmm. and we moved to san francisco about 14 years ago i think okay <clears throat> And, but the other draw is still LA, which is also, of course, a beast of a city where a lot of and we have an MBSO. Uh, yeah, we have we have an MBSO there, Netherlands, Netherlands Business, Business Support, Support Office. Okay, so uh, they're also part of the team. That's that's how we work and that's how it feels. So, what's the difference then between a consulate and an MBSO? Is it the consular work? Is it because it that's, sounds like both are well, an MBSO is much um, uh, let's say a consulate is much broader. Okay, of course, the, you have the consular work that we do, which is an important part of our mm-hmm. work. Uh, we focus on innovation. Uh, we have an innovation department. We focus on attracting U.S. investments to the Netherlands, mm-hmm. and those are things that the MBSO doesn't do. Okay, the MBSO is is more or less comparable with the economic department of an of an consulate mm-hmm. or an embassy so they they focus on helping dutch companies um that that want to set up shop or or you know make a deal in 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 the u.s okay and um, with a focus on small and medium-sized companies okay yeah, yeah makes sense well you mentioned it already but uh, we're here in southern california for urban dialogues uh, focusing yeah. on san diego tijuana which is the subject of a different podcast. So I'll add a link to that podcast in the description of this one. What's your takeaway from yesterday's discussion? Mm, Is there one? Yeah. Just one. Uh, uh, Probably too many to mention. (laughs) Yeah, there were quite a few. Mm -hmm. Uh, We we, uh, noticed during the wrap-up yesterday. I think it was a great event. Um, I had two main takeaways thinking about it. First of all, uh, we we did this together with uh, Tijuana, San Diego and uh, and the Netherlands, uh, specifically the Dutch cities of Zwolle mm-hmm. and the Arnhem Nijmegen region. Um, first of all, that that we always talk about shared challenges and 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 you know, it's all very comparable, but in practice, uh, you know, the context is is so completely different. Mm-hmm. When you hear we visited Tijuana yesterday morning, for instance. Yeah. And when you hear, and it wasn't a surprise for me because I, I worked in Panama and it's exactly the same there. So when you hear that whenever a new mayor or a new governor or a new president is elected, everything changes and everything that, you know, all the people change. Not only the ministers or the governors or the mayors. The bureaucrats. The, the, the administrators. The, the civil servants. Civil servants. Most yeah. of the civil servants change. Do they really? So you have sort of a, a destruction of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, every few years, mm-hmm. and then you start from zero again, and and in in those circumstances, it's very hard, you know, to to 
plan a city or to yeah. Uh, uh, make sure that the water uh, is managed in the right way and that the long-term investments are done. Um, so so that we should always keep that in mind, that the context can can be very, very different, mm -hmm. and, and, and which means that what works in the Netherlands doesn't necessarily work in, in the context of Tijuana, for instance. Right. Yeah. But at the same time... Um, one of the things that that spoke to me is that that um, in Tijuana, in San Diego, and in the Netherlands, you now active um, civil uh, society mm -hmm. really makes a difference. So we we had conversations in Tijuana with with you know, activists that were just kept on pushing for for bike lanes, for instance, for better infrastructure, uh, and they were sort of when. The government changes every few years, but they were, mm -hmm. they kept on pushing. Mm. So, so that makes a huge difference, and I think that's very important. And you see the same in San Diego, with uh, for instance the bike coalition here. You know, they keep pushing the, and and working with the municipality to to upgrade cycling infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think the same happens and happened in the Netherlands you mm -hmm. know, when when these changes started in our country in the 70s. It, it took off on the basis of, of civil uh, action, asking for, for uh, uh, biocycling infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and that's just an example f from the cycling sphere, but right, I right. think this, this applies much broader. And uh, yeah, that was for me uh, maybe the most important takeaway. Okay. I would, I would imagine it's a real challenge for companies that need long-term stability if they're going to invest a lot of money or even looking for a place to plant roots. I could see why that, that's a big challenge. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How do you see the Netherlands' role evolve in terms of promoting sustainable technology and innovation, particularly in collaboration with Silicon Valley and the broader tech ecosystem on the West Coast? Well, I think looking over the, let's say, the last decade, mm -hmm. uh, the ties between... Uh, the Dutch startup ecosystem and uh, and the ecosystem in Silicon Valley have grown stronger, are still growing stronger. Um, I think that's part of the result of the the, you know, the growing strength of the Dutch mm -hmm. tech ecosystem, um, but also of the yeah. And there's more and more connections uh, when you look at, for instance, the fastest growing Dutch startups. Mm -hmm. Most of them. Uh, uh, have investors from the U.S. from Silicon Valley in most cases on board. Okay, uh, that also help them scale to the U.S. Um, so I think about that differs a little from year to year, but I would say normally about 25 to 50 percent of of all venture capital investments in Dutch startups come from the U.S. Wow. Um, so that's yeah, I think a sign of the importance of of those connections. Right. That the ecosystem in in uh, especially in the Bay Area helps Dutch startups to to scale mm -hmm. uh, to the U.S. and and to the world. Uh, so that connection is, I think, super important for the uh, for the Dutch economy. Mm -hmm. uh, some people uh, are critical about that. They say, well, well, you know, we shouldn't sell out our companies mm -hmm. to uh, that that frame. But I completely. Yeah, I, I disagree with that mm -hmm. um, because what you see is that these these um, American venture capital firms they have such a good network. They 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 not only give you money, you know, they they really help you to to become successful in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I think for instance, Agen is a is a good example of that. Um, they they yeah specifically chose to work with um, American VCs mm -hmm. because they, they wanted to grow uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, I think that's an important aspect. Uh, we try to contribute to, to further strengthening those links. So we set up all sorts of programs. I uh, won't bother you with the details now, <laughs> but it's an important part of our work. Um, and you see, yeah, for instance, uh, yesterday evening, the CEO uh, of ASML uh, in the U.S. was mm -hmm. also present. 
and um, um, a company such as ASML, you know, it's 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 the biggest European tech company. Um, they make chips, is that right? Or they make the machines that make chips. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Make the machines that make chips. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, they're the biggest biggest Dutch company by now, also. Um, but they have uh, very important operations in in California. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, ASML would not have been what it is now without California. Without uh, that so partnership between uh, us. No, they're, they're, they they bought uh, a company here okay. uh, a long time ago that that makes the essential part of these machines, and they couldn't have made these these very complex machines that they make without the input of that. Californian company. Okay, but it's just an example sh- to show that how these these connections are super important for the Dutch economy as well. Mm-hmm. What can the Netherlands learn from Silicon Valley? I think a lot. I think Silicon Valley can also learn from the Netherlands. But but uh, the main thing for me, and that really um, I think is the most important thing, and and maybe the most important reason behind the success of the the Silicon Valley ecosystem, mm-hmm. is what they call here paying it f- paying forward paying, paying it forward. forward yeah okay so so everybody um, that you talk to even wh- me as a diplomat when i talk to people from the tech ecosystem in silicon valley mm-hmm. almost always uh, during the conversation or at the end of the conversation they will say how can i help you mm-hmm. and this this willingness to connect with others and to see how you can you know uh, help them uh, further along their path and and the, the the reasoning or the thought behind this is okay if well if we help each other mm-hmm. you know, next time who knows you might be able to help me mm. and that is really deeply ingrained in in the culture and i think that's that's an important part of the success and and i think unfortunately we have that much less in the netherlands mm. i think it's growing but also the when when uh, for instance uh, people strike it rich when they bring their company to the stock exchange. Uh, most of the time, they invest a large part of, of their money in, in new companies. And okay. They become angel investors. and So there's sort of a revolving character in that ecosystem, which is super important. You mean, okay, so here in Silicon Valley, that yeah, yeah, you yeah. notice that. Yeah. That's interesting. I never, I never um, realized that. I guess they're also trying to maintain their investments. They know that uh, startups are risky, but it with big risk comes big payoff at the same time. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You're closing out your fourth year as Consul General in San Francisco. What's been the highlight? Or what are you most proud of during your term? Mm, Well, a few things come to mind. Um, I'm I'm proud of what we were able to to build um, in terms of programming for Dutch startups that Mm -hmm. want to scale to the U.S. That is, for me also, a part of my work that makes me very, uh, it gives me a lot of energy. Uh, it's just a lot of fun and it's inspiring to work with these these young Dutch entrepreneurs that you know have big dreams mm-hmm. and 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 um, um, want to come to the U.S. And we re- I, and by now I I'm yeah able to say that w- we can really help them in that um, in making that step and that is something I'm proud of. And then we had, <clears throat> yeah, quite a few very special visitors. Uh, the visit of our queen was an absolute highlight. When was that again? Uh, it was September 22. Okay. And um, yeah, that was just amazing. And and we visited, f- that was for me the highlight of that visit, the Castro neighborhood, which is the, say, the LGBTQ neighborhood Okay. in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Very famous all over the world for that. And uh, she went there with the mayor, and and our queen was completely dressed in very bright pink. Oh, I remember the photos. And yes. that was just so. And it was a beautiful day, and mm-hmm. and and there were some dr- drag queens <laughs> offering <laughs> our queen flower. It was just such an amazing, amazing day. So that's definitely another highlight. And a visit of our prime minister, which I mentioned already in December, yeah. uh, which probably uh, will turn out to be one of his last trade missions, uh, was also very special. He is uh, somebody I, I really came to admire uh, in, in terms of his energy and, and how he's able to connect with people and is really an asset for our country. Okay. Yeah. 
How did you experience living in San Francisco and working with Americans? Oh, I love it. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not looking forward to leaving yet, to be oh. honest. Uh, I still have a few months. No, I think when you look at San Francisco, it's, it's a unique place. You know, it is, uh, I always say it's, um, it's a city of, of rebels. City of rebels? Yeah. How, okay. Yeah, you know, when you think about uh, the the beat generation in in the forties and fifties, Jack Kerouac, etc., okay. Allen Ginsberg, and then you had the hippie movement, which started there, of course, and Ken Casey, and 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 all that. Uh, and uh, I think there's a thread running from that to the startup founders of nowadays, who are also you know, sort of aiming to disrupt the status quo. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's a city of gold diggers. 49ers. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And and there, there's another threat running through the city from <laughs> the gold rush yeah. to the venture capital ecosystem uh, now. And it's that, that combination of, let's say, hyper-capitalism and, and, and disruption. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't, there's not another place in the world where you, where you see that go hand in hand in such a strong manner. Mm-hmm. So that makes it a, yeah, a super interesting place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's yeah, it's also just a beautiful city you know, with, with the hills, and uh, it's very walkable, bikeable. Um, mm-hmm. It's surrounded by beautiful nature, uh, so it's it's just yeah, it's a wonderful place to temperate to climate work in. all year too, right? Yeah, it it's never good. cold, it's never too hot. Yeah, it can get very foggy, foggy. <laughs> especially <laughs> in our neighborhood, but never snows, right? Uh, very seldom. I haven't very seen uh, snow in uh, the last four years now. Hmm. No. And, and I think uh, about working in San Francisco, we're culturally quite close, I think. Um, the, and the, your, the colleagues at the, the, the consulate, the, you mean? No, I mean the, 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 the Dutch people and, the, the, let's say, the Californians. Okay, okay. Uh, we tend to like each other. Mm-hmm. You know, they've all been to, the Netherlands, to Amsterdam. They, all, we, they think we're cool. <laughs> and we're a cool country. And we think that California is cool, and we, we tend to get along well. And that makes it also easy, uh, easier to, to work and to connect. And, and I've been blessed with an amazing, fantastic team at the consulate. Uh, so, so, yeah, it's been a, a great run for me here. Do you know where your next posting is? No, I'm waiting a few more weeks, and then I will know. Yeah. Okay. All right. I have one more question for you. You mentioned uh, your love of music earlier. Uh-huh. Just curious, if you could only listen to one CD album for the rest of your life. Oh, my God. What would that be? I think it would be Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Kind of Blue by yeah. Miles Davis. It could, uh, could also have been uh, any Beatles album or Steely Dan album. Uh, but Miles Davis has this sort of timeless deepness, the quality that... Uh, it, Never bores. At least, never bores me. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's, it's just a beautiful music. I'm, I'm not familiar with it. I, of course, I know who Miles Davis is, but I'm not. I, I do Check know, it out. I do know the Beatles. Not a big fan. Steely Dan. I'm, I'm more of a '80s guy. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. What '80s? Michael Jackson. Uh, the opposite. More Metallica. Ah, Iron you're a rocker. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Metallica, another band from San Francisco. It is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, when you mentioned music in San Francisco, that was the first thing that came to uh-huh. my mind that they they came from uh, they yeah. came from there. Um, but yeah, that's if I had to choose one, it would be it would be more in the in those lines, <laughs> more in the popular music. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you again, Dirk, for jo- joining me for this episode of Five Fragen. Though I asked more than five questions again, I'm sure. And to our listeners. Thank you for tuning in. Please tell us what you think in the comments below and be sure to click on the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss our next episode or the other videos we post on our YouTube channel. I'll be back behind the microphone next month with another member of the Dutch Diplomatic Network in the U.S. Until then, you can keep up with our work on any of our social media channels, Facebook, X, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Just search for NL in the USA and you can stay up to date on how the United States and the Netherlands have a partnership that works.